church. Good morning. Very festive in here today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> that helped last week to set up and decorate church for us. Sitting in the spirit. Let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us and suffering that we may have fellowship with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit. We pray like, right now you'll take control of our service, take control of us, speak to our hearts, help us to love and have compassion for each other, Lord, and for those outside who are on my other. We pray you'll just God rich as it leads us in worship and song. Thank you for Karen as she plays so beautifully. Ladies Karen and Sherry, and all they do, Lord. Thank you for the counsel and the general of the And everybody, Lord, we thank you for your way of family and the ones in our lives today. Thank you for the Sunday school teachers, everybody involved in that ministry, and all the other ministries we have in this church, Father. We pray your anointing will be upon the pastor today. You open up our hearts, break up our talent ground. Help us to learn, help us to want to learn. Help us to want to grow and produce fruit. Because we know what your word says. And if we don't produce fruit, what happens, Lord? And help us to praise you and honor you, Lord, and help each other. And we give you all praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Scripture reading today is John 1, 14. Sunday school, 945 to 1045 for adults and children, uh, and also online via Zoom. Thursday night is our Bible study, resuming this Thursday night. Uh, everybody's welcome, either in person or on Zoom. Again, we're studying the red letter words of Jesus. Uh, very good. And uh, it's very interesting, so please come out and speak up and minister to one another and uh, help us to magnify the Lord together in what we learn and what we praise Him about. Also, to uh, Angel Tree, there will be an announcement about that, maybe. Ladies, do we have anything for Angel Tree? Do you want to mention anything about that? Hi, everyone. Um, there is still one angel on the tree. One. Just one. Oh, you got it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. We'll see you. Just see Carlene or myself when we write it down. And next week is last week to turn those in unwrapped. And I want to encourage each and every person, whether you're in here or on the uh, stream line, to pray for those families and children and to just really, um, you know, thank God for them and an opportunity to bless those kids and families. They're going to get a Bible. I've got uh, 11 Bibles that were mailed to me. And they're going to get a Bible. And hopefully we have people that attend our party on the 10th of December, this Christmas party that we're holding for the children. Where they're going to receive their present, lunch, games. Perhaps who's going to tell the Christmas story. So pray for that event that people will not feel embarrassed to be there. Um, and that we can bless them. Thank you so much for this opportunity, guys. I love you all. Thank you. And is it next Monday? Is it ladies carrying and sharing me? That's still yes. on? Yes? Thank you. Next Monday, mark that on your calendar, but we'll be in the bulletin next week. Uh, December 18th is our annual church dinner after the church service in the morning, about 12 o'clock or so. Everybody's welcome to come. Now, do we all bring something, or is it just, uh, how's that work usually? Pretty much the ladies have everything. The men are down. Yeah. Uh, do you have a specialty that you'd like to bring, or a traditional?
traditional thing, because nobody's going to turn you away. Yeah. If you got food in your hand, I tell you. <laughs> and also, uh, next week I noticed Karen usually, we, we usually bring free groceries for people that if you want to uh, pick some up on the way home or whatever. Last week I think it was cottage cheese and something like that. Uh, this week I'm not sure if Karen has any. But I went to the pantry over there in Winslow this week for my for, um, nephew. And he had texted me back. He said, I still have plenty of food. I don't need it. I said, fine. I'll take it to church. It'll be on Sunday. And it'll keep. And if anybody wants to help themselves, there's two bags up here in the vestibule or whatever on the foot of steps. And uh, you can just look through there. There's like camel soup and uh, uh, chili. And I think there's uh, liquid milk. And there's also powdered milk and stuff in there. So if anybody can use any of that, or if you know a neighbor or a friend or relative that could use some of that stuff, please help yourself with it, because I'm just going to have to take it home again or whatever. But, uh, you know, help yourself to that. And I'll, I have produce so I'll be in, in my car out front. My okay. Adrian will be out there. So okay. Produce, I have right out front here, Karen's car, big white one, right? Toyota, right? Big white Toyota. She'll have produce in there for you if you want to hang around until she gets there. And, can you share with that? Adriana, Adriana, okay, she'll be there too. Thank you, Adriana. Any other announcements I didn't pick up on? Okay. You're just going to come and lead us in song and worship. Please worship the Lord with him. Thanksgiving, some of you received a text or heard uh, that rioting um, 
Tony and uh, Karen's great-granddaughter, she got kicked by a horse in, in the face. And uh, uh, she chipped and broke a couple of teeth. She needed some, uh, she got, but they got a CAT scan done and she's mentally doing fine. And so praise God and just pray for her physical, uh, I guess, healing, rehab. And I don't know what in store, what's ahead of her, if they're gonna need any kind of stuff surgery or if it's just fixing the teeth or I'm not sure but uh but yeah keep her in your prayer she you guys know you've seen her running around she's a beautiful little girl I, I just felt oh, when I heard that I was like, oh, what is it so, so sad but then the pain that she's enduring as well so keep her in your prayers but uh it just says right now has has a, oh has a concussion I was told she did oh god has a concussion missing and chipped teeth stitches so um uh, Jen McCormick asked us to pray for her, her uh, niece Sasha, who uh, just got put into a facility. They were having all kinds of challenges with her, so she's in the facility. Adriana asked us to keep her in your prayers because she's been sick. She, and then also Lily's sick, so keep Lily in your prayers. I thought Lily was going to be here this morning. And I saw you. So keep Lily in your prayers. She's been sick since Thanksgiving, you said? So. And then uh, um, Jen McCormick also asked us to pray for her friend Kylie.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here this morning and join together in fellowship because of your spirit. Lord, we thank you that we can fellowship with you through your spirit. Lord, we thank you that the way that you work in our lives and the love, the grace, the mercy, Lord, that we can approach your throne of grace because of your mercy. Lord, we thank you that we have the right to be called children of God and the love that you have for us. The love that we can have for one another. Father, we pray that you continue to put your hand upon this vine this morning. But as we enter into this, this Christmas season, let it not be a distraction, but we focus us on you. So this morning, Lord, we pray that you, you refocus us. Whatever's going on in our lives, the distraction, the worries, all these prayer requests, Father, we lift them up to you now. We, we thank you and that we can bring these things to you. We thank you and praise you for the ways you work. And we ask that you work in our hearts as you conform us to, to your, in, your will, as you conform us to your Son. You work in our minds as you give us peace uh, over these things. And then, Lord, work in these lives, in these bodies, in these hearts. And hear our prayers this morning and strengthen our faith through the ways you answer our prayers. this body, ready this group of believers as we come together this morning prepare us for worship, prepare us for your word, whatever you have in, whatever you have in store for us this morning as we talk to one another share with one another, sharpen with one another, encourage one another, and Father we need to pray you use us this morning as you bless this body, allow our Bible church, this body to bless the name of the Lord. Lord be with those who aren't here this morning who are away who are traveling, be with those who are sick and aren't feeling well, be with those who are hurt, injured, Father, let them know that they are missed, they are loved, they are appreciated, that they are part of this body. And Lord, we continue to strengthen this body. And we continue to thank you. Lord, we thank you for uh, the freedoms we have. That we can come here and worship you with spirit and truth. Lord, we thank you for that freedom. Help us to, to never take it for granted. Help us to realize the blessing that it is. And Lord, we lift up our elected officials. We thank you that we have the freedoms to vote. And Lord, we, we trust in you that you put so we, we put them in your hands. We, have, we thank you and ask you to work in their hearts and our souls and their need to help them understand their need for salvation. And Lord, we thank you for these leaders. Make decisions through them. And Lord, use them to make to accomplish your will. And we thank you. We thank you for, for this country. And we thank you for in this place we, the, the, when you placed us. Use us. Help us to be influential of your love wherever it is you guide me. And we thank you for this body. So bless this morning as we encourage and sharpen one another, strengthen one another. Use us throughout this week. Who needs prayer? Who needs a text message? Who needs a phone call? Who needs encouragement? Allow us, Lord, we thank you that you allow us to do your bidding. So use us to be an infinite impact on those you've placed in our hands. We thank you. We thank you. So bless this time now. Bless this body now as we bless your name. Pray for them about and let them encourage one another to use this time.
so that's high. So my girlfriend says she wants to live with me, so she's hoping that that happens. But then she needs some money. And if not, somebody came with this idea. You know, traveling nurses, so they need places to stay. So I might, I might be open it up for that.
light the candles for me. So, uh, Jen, if you want to pull up, uh, um, I was going to talk for a little bit, but we'll see you up here now. Any purple one. But if you want to read the passage and then light the purple one, please, then I'll talk. For whatever was written in early times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. This is the candle of hope. Uh, we're doing Advent this year. For those who don't know, Advent means the coming. It's a Latin word. It was actually first in a, um, first time the Advent was mentioned was in, uh, at, at a church council at three, 300 AD, at the church council of Circos, I think it was. Uh, but it wasn't until 1839 that we put it in a cute little wreath and made candles out of it. It was a Lutheran uh, pastor who went to a child's uh, orphanage, a child's home. And uh, he brought a big wheel with 20 white candles and four red ones. And it was the countdown, the coming to Christmas. And that was the first Advent wreath. And uh, so we're, we, don't, we don't do it every year, but we'll do it this year just as a reminder, just as we, as we enter into the season, uh, because the season starts early this year, so we thought it'd be great to re uh, remember the coming. Now, each candle represents a character, uh, an aspect of uh, the Christmas holiday. There's hope, faith. Peace, joy. Uh, each each candle also represents uh, a Christmas character, so, um, such as the hope candle is the prophet candle, the candle of the prophets, and uh, that's why we read this scripture. For whatever was written in earlier times is written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement and uh, of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the prophets wrote things so that we could have the hope through that encouragement. And uh, we're going to look at some of the prophecies this morning. Um, one, of the most, one of the most popular is Isaiah 9. Uh, if you, you don't have to pull it up for me, but does anyone know Isaiah 9, where we get uh, the Christmas uh, prophecy from Isaiah 9? Yeah, I know, but does anyone know what it says? Of course, it pulls it up. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Uh, and I have a great little joke to go with that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a uh, pastor, this is years and years ago, back when they uh, uh, used to ride before cars, they would ride their horse and carriage into the cities. And uh, a pastor in the, in the country um, wanted to make a big banner that said, For unto us a child is born, and put it on the front of the church. It's a giant banner. And uh, so he asked his uh, assistant pastor to go into town and uh, board the banner. As he's going into town, the assistant realized he lost the dimension doesn't have what he asked him to, so he couldn't remember what he was supposed to say, what verse was it, was it unto uh, a, a virgin, I couldn't remember, so he telegraphs the pastor and says, lost dimensions and verse, please inform, but please advise, the lady, the uh, he pastor responds back with a telegraph, and when the telegraph lady picks up and reads it, she faints, because it said, for unto us a child is born, nine feet long, three feet high. <laughs> yeah, that's a really bad joke. I tell that every year, and every year it gets worse. <laughs> but <laughs> unto us a child is born. It's kind of interesting that, that that is one of the most popular Christmas uh, verses, and it's in the Old Testament. It's written 700 years before Jesus. One of the most popular Christmas verses, it takes place 700 years before Christmas. And, uh, but that's not the beginning of the, well, there's, there's a number of passages. And uh, we're going to look at three this morning. These three Old Testament prophecies, prophets, and the hope that they provide. Uh, so we're going to look at these three passages this morning. Uh, before we even do, though, we're going to ask God to bless our time. And I'm going to hope that this candle doesn't fall over and burn down the church. Because it's really wild. So Tony's not here this morning. If the church burns down on my watch, I'm going to feel really bad. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we come here this morning. Lord, I thank you for each person here, each person online, each person that you woke up, that you brought us out this morning. Lord, we thank you for this day, and this day that you made. Let us rejoice in it. Let us be glad in it. Uh, let us learn and grow through it. And Father, we pray that you speak to us this morning through your word. Lord, we thank you for this time, this time of year, and that we can celebrate and remember the coming, the advent 
of, of you in the flesh. And so, Lord, speak to us this morning. As I ramble on externally, Father, we pray you speak to us internally. And that, that you grip our hearts and draw us close to you. Bring us into your presence. Speak through me, not my words, but what you have for us to hear this morning. So speak to our hearts. Speak to our souls. Speak to our spirits. Strengthen us through your words, Lord. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you and we praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, the Christmas story starts 6,000 years before Christmas. The Christmas story starts uh, two and a half chapters into the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. And uh, many of you have seen uh, this passage before, but uh, uh, it, it's, it takes place after Adam and Eve have, uh, have um, just sinned. So Adam and Eve just ate the fruit, and they rejected God. They, they rejected God's advice. They, they disobeyed, and God was laying out the consequences of, of what took place. And he's, he says that, that, that the man will um, have to work amongst, and will sweat, work with the sweat of his brow, work amongst the thorns, and that there'll be pain and childbearing, and that the serpent will crawl on its belly. And then he says, and while speaking to the serpent, while speaking to Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And many of you have heard what the passage means. It's basically, it's a it's the first Christmas prophecy. It's probably, it is the first prophecy we see in the Bible and that, that, that God was uh, uh, saying to Satan, saying to the sin himself, that he's going to put a division. Now, we know that we all conceived in sin. We we're all born of sin. I'm learning that already. My son is a liar. My son, <laughs> he, he, he does. He, he manipulates. He's deceptive. He makes me think one thing. When he, and he does it to his mother so much more than he does it to me. I feel bad for her. He'll be screaming. And then... Just laugh at me on the side. <laughs> and it's like, that's not really crying. He's just, but we're born, we've been born into sin. But the sin, we learned right here, that when God said to Satan, said to the sin, I will put enmity, this division between your seed and the seed of woman, we see that the seed of uh, sin runs through the man. So when we're conceived in sin, it's the man that passes sin to his child. Adam passed it on uh, to his child, and we see what Cain did with that. And we see it so on and so forth. So sin runs through the seed of man. So if somehow, six, uh, eight thousand years ago, God told Adam, uh, told sin, told Satan that if somehow that man could be born without man involved. That man could be born perfect, sinless. So if somehow someone was able to make manufacture the test tube a human being, or p perhaps a virgin could give birth. That baby would be born perfect. Now, not only that, he tells us that there will be a baby born perfect. And that baby will bruise you on, he will, that sin will bruise the head. Satan will bruise the head of that seed, but also we see that that seed will, uh, I'm sorry, will bruise the head, but will strike on the heel, but will bruise his head. So basically, we're seeing that, 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 that he, the seed, will bruise the head of sin, will destroy sin. But even so, sin will hurt him, strike him on the heel, but he will destroy his head. He will destroy sin. So we see that this, this seed that comes, this perfect seed, seed will be a savior who will save us from our sins. Now, I start with that for a reason. How many of you have ever uh, felt weary? How many of you ever got tired? How many of you have, have... Now, I want you to understand that when we get discouraged, when we get weary, when we get tired, when we get frustrated, when we get... Uh, whether it's bitter or, uh, or whether it's... Uh, dis but when we get these negative past these feelings... Even if it's just tired, it's a result of sin. It's because we live in an evil, sinful world. We live in an imperfect world. The things that bother us, things that wear us down. One day, we're going to have perfect bodies, and we're going to have a perfect world that we live, live in, and no, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. But until then, there's going to be a lot of pain, a lot of tears, and a lot of suffering. And that's the world we live in. And it wears on us. It wears us down. But we're promised that one day there will be a savior who will strike the head of sin, who will destroy sin. And that only took place. And so we, now, let me tell you a little story. The reason I go through all this is because we're talking about hope. And uh, years ago I heard a story about a 16-year-old girl who uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. All right? And 
The doctors realize that after she goes through chemo and she goes through radiation, they can kill the, the cancer, but it's going to kill her. It was gonna, she's too young, her body's not developed yet, it's going to wear her down. And they said the only way she's going to survive, she won't make it three years after radiation and chemo. The only way possible is that she got a bone marrow transplant. So they started searching for a donor. The mom, the dad, the brother, the cousins, the aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, no one was a match. So mom and dad, mom in her late 30s and dad in her early 40s, did anyone guess what they did? They had another baby. They had a baby, that baby was born. And when that baby was 14 months old, they were able to take a little bit of the baby's bone marrow and transfer, transplant it into the, 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 the 16 year old. And she lived, she's still alive for that. She lived, she's living a great, healthy life. Her little sister likes to say, I was born to save. She was born for the purpose of saving. Now, the reason I tell that story is because that's where the Christmas story start, starts. We have pain, we have discouragement, we, have, we feel weary, we feel distressed, we get bitter, we get anxious, we get, uh, but understand these things are a result of sin. And the Christmas story starts with the prophecy of a savior, one who was born to save. But not only that, I wanna, but in Romans 8, you also see um, a passage that, I just wanna encourage you guys with this. What, shall we, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him, with him freely give us all things? We have our doubts about so many things in this world. We feel weary. So many things wear us down. So many things cause bitterness and distraction. So much things cause distress inside of our hearts and cause friction in our relationships. And these things are a result of sin. And we question these things. And these things cause us to lose hope. These things cause us to get distracted and take our focus off what, we're, what we need to be doing. And, and understand that he who gave us his only son, he freely gave his son, his son, will he not freely give us all things? What do we think that, and it makes me wonder what that, what the parents would have done with that child. How far, if you had that child, the child was born and to save, how far would they have gone to save their daughter? Because this child was born to save. Well, we don't have to ask that question. But what we can know is how far God will go to save you. We think that the stress is just part of life. No, the stress is a result of sin, and we've been saved from that. We think bitterness and anxieties are a result of life. No, bitterness and anxieties are a result of sin, and we've been saved from that. And we think uh, the, the lack of peace and the friction in our relationships and the friction we have with others is just part of life. No, it's a result of sin, and we have a Savior who <coughs> redeemed us from that. He was born to save and if you put your faith in him, we've already been saved. And that's where the Christmas story starts. And it's kind of neat. It starts there that we see that one day a Savior will be born of a virgin. Imagine if the story ended there. We'd be reading. We'd be reading. But uh, we see that somewhere along the lines of 5,000 years later, they were still waiting. 5,000 years later. Now I'm going to go through the history of Israel. I'm not going to go through this. But uh, there was a king named Ahaz. Who pulled, um, king named Ahaz. Now, he was the king of the southern kingdom. King of the southern kingdom. And uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. Now, just imagine if you had brothers who were living 50 miles north. Some people have brothers who live 50 miles north. They would have been considered a different kingdom. All right? Now, just imagine if there was a kingdom called Syria, which you don't have to imagine that, but you imagine the times. Syria came and invaded the northern kingdom. And then took them over, so they convinced the king of the northern kingdom to invade the southern kingdom with them. So this would happen. Syria and Israel invaded Judah. How would you feel if you were the king of Judah and Israel is invading you? Any thoughts? Any feelings? I can imagine to be discouraged. I can imagine to be bitterness. I can imagine he feels weary. I can imagine he feels distressed. I can, and that's where he was at. That's where King Ahaz was at. Now... For those who don't know the, the prophecy we're leading up to now, Ahaz was uh, promised that God will, will, will provide. Ahaz was promised that God will provide, a, 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 that God will free them, that, God, that, that anyone who believes will be spared. Anyone who puts their faith in God will be spared this, this, this bitterness, will be spared uh, the, the tax. And, and God did spare them, but Ahaz didn't believe. Here's why Ahaz didn't believe. You know why Ahaz didn't believe? 
because things were bad. You guys are all staring at me like you didn't do it yourselves. How often do things not go according to the way we want and we get discouraged? We go, ah, God's not working anymore. God's not with me. God's not here for me. Because things don't go according to what we think is going to happen. Things get, we get discouraged, we get distressed, we get bitter, and then we all, all of a sudden turn our back on God. And we think, well, God's not with me. God's not here. God's not working. This is not God's will. This is not what God wants. God's not moving in my life because things are not going the way I want them to. And Ahaz is being invaded. So God says to Ahaz, look, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to just ask a sign and I'll prove it. God comes with And Ahaz gets this bitterness. He goes, oh, I'm not going to ask you for a sign. I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. Now it sounds here, the Lord said, give the sign. Uh, the, the verse before, I thought, I didn't give you that, sorry. <laughs> but the verse before, it says, the Lord says, ask for a sign. And Ahaz says, I'm not going to put the Lord, my God, to the test. I'm not going to ask the Lord for a sign. And so often, this... Um, we had the same approach. So often, we, when things aren't going our way and we get discouraged, we know we're supposed to be faithful. We know we're supposed to follow God. But so often, we get our backs up towards God. We get bitter. We get angry. We get distressed. We get because God's not doing things our way. And so we get stubborn and we get proud. And God's, God said to look. Listen now, House of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try to teach the men? What will you try? Oh, sorry. It's too far. Sorry. I'm going down to the but uh, he says in verse 12, he says, look, ask for a sign. Just ask for a sign, and I'll show you how I'm going to redeem you. Ask for a sign, and I'll show you. And Ahaz says, I'm not going to put the Lord of God to the test. Try to be righteous. Try to be better than that. Now, I love this because this is something we all try to do. That, that, that things aren't going our way. Things aren't going the way that we hope. And so we try to act like we're doing the right things. And so how often do we go, well, <coughs> I just thought it was something really neat. Uh, because I just looked at uh, Margie's thing, and um, uh, they both said something to me. They both, Margie used a line last week, and this is so perfect for hope. Uh, well, the verse here, let's go to 714, and I'll tell you the story about Margie thing. <laughs> they don't know what I'm going to say, but that's why I do it with that. Therefore, the Lord your God, the Lord himself, will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be, born, will be with child and will bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. You guys know what Emmanuel means, right? God with us. Think about that. This is an individual who the reason he's not believing in God, the reason he's, str not tr he's struggling, the reason he's not trusting, the reason he's bitter is because he feels God's not there. And God's sitting here showing him a promise saying, God is with you. And it's so funny to me because so often I see people distressed. I see people bitter. I see people anxious. I see people worried. And look, going in this time of year, more than most, more than, time, more than most times of year, people get worried. People that are not financed. People get bitter. People get anxious. People get distressed. And, 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 and he was that way because he was not trusting in God. He, because God. Because he was looking at the things he's doing. Well, here's why I say that. Because uh, last week, I uh, asked him, uh, Margie how things were going. Things with Aunt Mary with the pirates, but she's in the middle of a move. Margie just moved, and we praise God for that. I pray for Margie because she's now in a new house, and she's in a new environment, and, 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 and all these things going on. Plus, don't forget that Margie just lost her husband six months ago, uh, five months ago, four months ago, three months ago, four months ago. Four. Margie just lost her husband recently. Uh, and, and, and so she, she's, th th there's those aspects, and then she's dealing with all the, the move, and she's dealing with uh, her. Uh, her, her uh, late husband's aunt, who's with all those aspects. And I said to her, how's everyone doing? And she responded, do you remember what you said, the question you asked me? Thank you. Yeah. Can you guess what she asked me? How do you do? No. What do you say to me often? Not about me, about you. She said, how do people manage without God? How do people manage without God in their life? And look, God with us. But so often we get discouraged. So often we get, uh, we get distressed. We get anxious. We get worried because God's working, but we don't trust him. We don't have faith in how he's working. God's in complete control. God is completely sovereign. He, he who is with us, who can be against us? If he is with us, who can be against us? He who gave us all, or he, 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 not, he not freely give us all things. But yet, it's, we get worried. We get discouraged. We lose hope. See, uh, Next week we're going to talk about faith. I think it's a thing. But next week, we're, but hope and faith are different. Faith produces.
produces works. Hope produces endurance, the ability to continue to push through. And so often we get distressed, we get weary, we get tired, we get frustrated, we get anxious, we get bitter because we lose hope. We just lose sight of, 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 of what's to come. We lose sight of that perspective and we lose that hope. And uh, <laughs> the Lord, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name God with us. See, this was written 700 years before, but it was a promise, a promise. So these, so I, I love this because Isaiah wrote this, and I'm not expecting the pastor to look at it, Isaiah wrote it well. But you know what Isaiah never experienced? You know what Isaiah never experienced the same way we have? God with us. He never experienced the same way that the Holy Spirit, well, he had the Holy Spirit, God, but that, that, that seal of, of, of God, that, that his presence in our life, his presence on this earth. See, you, and, and um, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, we don't have to pull it up, but you can if you want to. I don't know exactly what verse it is, uh, but, but it talks about the prophets, when it says about the prophets. But 1 Peter it talks about the idea that that the prophets who wrote these things, who talked about these things, didn't even know what they were prophesying about. They didn't even know the specifics. They didn't know the specific details. But what they did do it for themselves, you know who they wrote those things for? You. Me. They wrote these things for us so that we can have an understanding of these things. See, you have a better understanding of God's presence in your life than the prophet Isaiah. You have a better understanding of God with us, of God, the Holy Spirit of God moving through you. You have a better spirit of seeing how God moved than Isaiah had. He, he might have experienced it, but he didn't know it the same way we have the same scripture. We have God with us. But yet we still lose hope. We lose that perspective. We lose that hope. Um, I, 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 don't, I want to share it real quick. Um, I want to look to see how many what I have on the verse. Because um, this is, this is a story, that, that, not a story, a study, I guess, that, that I just read a couple days ago when I was preparing for this. And I, I wasn't going to share this, uh, but it, it's such a weird thing. But I, I want you to see, see something, all right? They did a study, this is years ago, with laboratory rats. Bear with me. I know this is this something you don't get turned off by this. And Maria, I apologize to any other vegetarians here. Because the rats die. That's why we don't do studies with laboratory rats anymore. But they did a study with laboratory rats. It's so evil, almost mean what they did. They just took these rats and threw them in water and let them drown. That's basically what they did. They took a bunch of rats and threw them in, in, in water for 24 hours and let them drown. They took, after 24 hours, none were alive. Then they took another group of rats, put them in the same, same thing of water, but every five hours, they lifted them out of the water for a second and put them back in. And that's it. It didn't give them a break, it didn't give them rest. 24 hours later, every single rat was still alive. Why was that? Because of hope. They had something to fight for, something to look forward to, something. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, in Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 27, uh, you, the, the, my, one of my son's favorite songs, Blessed Assurance, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. This blessed this confidence that we have in, in Jesus, this confidence that we have, this blessed assurance, is a foretaste of, look, these kingdom moments that we call them. Every once in a while, the Holy Spirit will tug on our heart and say, hey, do this. And that's a kingdom moment. That's God working through you. That one day we will spend eternity in that moment, in that foretaste, of, in that glory divine. One day, and, and to whom God will to make known what is the riches of his glory. This mystery, this mystery that, that I, it was a mystery to Isaiah, this fellowship with God. He wrote about it. It was a mystery to Jeremiah, even though he wrote about this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The mystery that Christ will dwell in us one day. At all times, this mystery, Christ in you. What is that mystery, Christ in you? The hope of glory. One day. And see, you experience it now for moments. You experience it now for it, 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 it twinkles and we experience it now for it's just here and there. But one day, for eternity, we will experience that glory. Right now, we get a hope of that glory. We get a glimpse of that glory. We get a, oh, what a foretaste of that glory divine. And we had it for these moments. But ladies and gentlemen, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. There's no reason for us to dwell on that bitterness. There's no reason for us to have that anxiety. There's no reason for us to have that worry, to 
the stress, the, 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 those negative passions, those negative feelings, because we have the Christ in us. And that is the hope of glory. One day we'll spend eternity in that glory. We'll share the inheritance of that glory. We'll get to experience that glory. But right now, we get a foretaste of that glory. And that's Christ in you. And it was a mystery to Isaiah. But it's, it, 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 but it's fact to each one of us who are a child of God. And, and Isaiah continued to write and talk about this. Look, he said that, that the virgin, that, so in Genesis chapter 3, we see that the Savior is going to come by way of a virgin. And then we see that, that, that the virgin is going to give birth to, a, to that Savior. And that Savior is going to be God himself. God in the flesh. And then Isaiah continues in chapter 9. He tells us uh, that, that this virgin who's going to give birth to the Savior, uh, God, who's going to be God himself. Well, for those, verse 6, I gave you 16. I'm sure that was me. I'm sure that was me. If, it was, if you had 14 up there, I would say it was you. If you had, like, but the fact it was 16, I, that just seems like something I would do. Add a one. But uh, for a child will be born unto us, and a son be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. I want the next verses too. Yeah, next verses. Like, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. And it goes on and says, There will be no end to the increase of his government. Or of his peace. There's no end to his peace. No end to his peace. On the third day of November, to, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord and the host will accomplish this. Hope produces endurance. So often we lose that hope because, well, we get caught up in the now. We get caught up in the small things that are taking place now. That's why, look, look, I, I, I wouldn't play that reason this now, but I've, I've shared this a number of times, and I have a couple minutes before I wrap up. If you want God to receive an inheritance of $50 million, and all you had to do was drive to New York City to pick it up, you just had to go there, put, put, sign, and you receive $50 million, cash, check, Deposit your bank, anybody you want fifty million dollars, and you're driving to New York, and your car breaks down. Do you get discouraged? No. Do you care? No. You just leave it on the side. I'll get a new one. <laughs> see, see. But when we're looking forward to glory, and we have these temporary setbacks, we get discouraged because our eyes no longer are on glory, but our eyes become on the setbacks. Our, we, we no longer keep our eyes focused on eternity but we get caught up in the temporary, not the eternal. And um, hope, hope creates endurance. Hope produces an endurance. Uh, there, there's, a, uh, there's a story about it. Uh, it's a true story about a man, um, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, Eugene Land. Anyone ever heard of Eugene Land? No? Eugene Land, he, uh, you guys probably heard what Eugene Land did, especially if anyone ever watched The Office. Okay, Eugene Land took a, 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 a he, I, I'll tell you, you don't know, know what I mean, you watch office. Eugene Land uh, was asked to speak to a class of uh, sixth graders, all right, in Harlem. And he found out before he went there to speak that the, 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 the graduation rate was less than 40%. 40%. So these 60 kids, most likely somewhere around 20 of them will graduate. The other 40 of them are just going to drop out. And he's like, how do I inspire? What do I see? help them. How can I even help them if they're all going to drop out of hell and just drop out someday and not even do anything? So how can I inspire them? How can I motivate them? How can I encourage them? And he was a wealthy man, so when he went to the class, he promised them that, that he'll pay for their college education if they graduate. Now those who've seen the office go, oh, I, Michael Scott did that. Right? But, uh, but, but he promised them. Well, over 90% of those sixth graders ended up graduating. Uh, it, it, yeah, it was something along the lines of I think only four didn't graduate of the 60 or 59, 55 of them graduated. And they asked one of the kids at graduation, why was your class so different? And he said, this is a quote from one of the teenagers who graduated. He said, it was the first time in my life I had something to look forward to. It was as if, it was as if something was waiting for me. That's all he needed was hope. All we needed was hope. And ladies and gentlemen, you have the greatest hope. You have the hope of glory. You have the hope of eternity. 
with the Savior. Uh, not only that, but on this earth, you have the hope that a Savior will redeem you, that a Savior will provide for you, that a Savior will protect you, that a Savior will be with you. So you have a redeeming Savior who's going to be with you, provide, protect, and take care of you, and then one day he's preparing for you glory. How do we get discouraged? Well, it's because we take our eyes off the eternal and put them on the temporary. So, so this Christmas, as we enter into this Christmas season, as we go through these these candles, as we go through these characteristics, as we look at these individuals, let's remember that that, that it's not just a story. That, that this that this that this is hope. That we have an eternal hope. That a hope not only for this world, but a hope of glory, a hope for eternity. And the only thing that's causing the distractions, the only thing that's causing the worries, the only thing that's causing the bitterness, the only thing that's causing the anxieties, the only thing that's causing these things is that we're taking our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that you provide. Lord, we thank you for the price that was paid that we could have this hope of glory. Lord, continue to do a work in each one of us. Continue to instill into us this hope and this endurance to persevere through the challenges, persevere through the struggles. And Lord, help us to fix our eyes on what's eternal because we know that the things that are eternal things that are temporary, things that are seen are temporary, and things that are unseen, Lord, we know that they are eternal, and that their glory rests with you. So continue to do a work, continue to instill into us hope and endurance, and continue to thank you. Lord, allow us to glorify you with our lives, and as we leave this place, continue to remind us of your hope. Continue to thank you, and we pray it all. In Jesus' name,